President Sullivan, Ms. Director, members of the Board of Visitors, Vice Presidents, Deans, members of the faculty, my colleagues, honored guests, and not least, the families and friends of the graduating class of 2017. Before I proceed with my remarks, I want to elaborate echoing Terry on these opening acknowledgments. For no one reaches this occasion without the assistance and support of many, many people. I know without knowing your names, the sacrifices you have made, the anxieties you have endured, the hopes you have sustained, the encouragement you have showered on these our graduates who sit proudly before us, ready to leave us to commence the next stage of their journeys. First, let me acknowledge and applaud the mothers and fathers, grandparents, aunts and uncles, neighbors, friends, step-parents, brothers, sisters, professors, boos and ex-boos and wannabe boos, <laughs> the whole kit and caboodle. Happily, we have now reached that stage in our development as a species when we define kin in multiple ways. So if I have missed any categories, shout them out now. How, <laughs> however we define kin, whether traditional or non-traditional, we know that without their support, so many of our efforts would have run aground. So another round of applause for you. I am humbled, honored, and privileged to have been invited to address you on so momentous an occasion, and I want to begin with a confession. As soon as I accepted this invitation, fear and dread set in. After all, speaking at commencement can be a fraught affair. Students and faculty can reject a speaker before she ever sets pen to page, and if she manages to overcome the outcry, the opposition and petitions, and actually steps up to the podium, the members of the audience can turn their backs, drowning out the speech with hisses, boos, and bullhorns. At least as far as I know, no one objected to my standing here today. But that fact has done nothing to allay my anxieties in the lead up to this occasion. Literally every day since receiving this invitation, one question has been nagging me. What could I possibly say to you that hadn't already been said? And by my oratorical betters, what could I say particularly in these desponding times that would not cast a pall over this celebration? No joke. I have literally been sweating and fretting and pacing the floor of my study for several weeks, snapping all too often at two innocent little children <laughs> who were simply dying to know when I would be finally finished with that speech so we could resume our weekly at-home talent shows featuring my niece dancing the Quan, my nephew singing James Brown, he has mastered the scream, and me joining in as Maceo. As a literary scholar, I am naturally a student of genre and audience, and thus I know that even when certain generic conventions shift and evolve with the times, others abide, including those centuries-old conventions defining the commencement address. Immemorially, commencement speakers have been expected to discharge their function as seasonal sources of sage advice dispensed in digestible nuggets preferably sweet nuggets. Those of you who may have taken my classes or colleagues who have had to listen to me drone on in various meetings know that I am singularly incapable of delivering anything in digestible nuggets, and certainly not sweet ones. Why am I sharing this information, you are surely asking by now. Should it be regarded in these times as seemly oversharing? I do so for two reasons. One, 
From time to time, it helps to demystify authority figures, especially professors, to chunk them down a bit in your imaginations where many live rent-free as bloated superegos, dogging your every step and effort. Two, in an aggressively product-oriented society, we don't leave much time to recognize, honor, or accept the realities and certainties, uncertainties of process, of gestation. As students about to leave these hallowed grounds, I am sure you have found yourselves lamenting how little time you actually have to process the wealth of information you take in from day to day, from course to course. For the next five page, 10 page paper, or honors thesis is breathing down your neck. In honor of process then, I've chosen to invite you in to share with you selected stages in the making of this address. In other words, I invite you to listen to my narrative of the stages before the stage. Stage one, returning to the question, what can I say? What should I say? I come from a people who believe in the idea and power of ancestors. And thus, as I continued to pace and fret, I was not at all surprised to be visited by the late African-American poet and essayist Audre Lorde, who gave me a clear directive, go back and read my essay, <laughs> The Transformation of Silence into Language and Action. I read aloud a frequently excerpted passage. What is most important to me must be spoken made verbal and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised and misunderstood. And then came the familiar, always arresting question of that essay. What are the words you do not yet have? What do you need to say? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own? I closed the book. I could not answer. And in this moment of avoidance, I resorted to that tried, true, and sanctioned response of a scholar to a question she is not yet ready to answer. Keep reading. Keep researching. And so I began to read commencement addresses. Among the dozens I have read or listened to since accepting this invitation, I have discovered one common denominator. With few exceptions, the speaker proceeds from the particulars of place, from her or his specific location or vocation. Actors speak about acting, musicians music, comedians comedy, politicians politics, physicians patients, <coughs> preachers preaching. Although when Ralph Waldo Emerson delivered the Divinity School address at the Harvard Divinity School in 1838, among the most famous in the annals of commencement speeches, he had renounced his vocation as a preacher. That fact did not deter him from railing against preachers categorically. His address to a tiny class of six students, together with their families, friends, and teachers, was anything but sweet. The speech created such consternation that Emerson was immediately branded an apostate and subsequently banished from Harvard for nearly 30 years thereafter. As my speech today comes near the end of my almost 30-year tenure at this university, perhaps I can be indulged, no matter what I say here, and allowed to ride out at UVA the few remaining years I hope to claim membership in the professoriate. And it is from this humble vocation that I speak to you this morning, practicing some tools of my training, framing, supplementing, reading texts close up, but also challenging interpretive complacencies. At its worst, close reading is a retreat from the world outside the bounds of a book. At its best and most ethical, it is a process that ultimately transcends the specificities and formalities of any given work, as well as the finite parameters of the page, reaching outward in multiple directions 
to arrive at some broader challenge, lesson, or multiple directives. As the current director of the Carter G. Woodson Institute, I endeavor to advance the belief of the scholar historian for whom the Institute is named. Carter G. Woodson, who writes, real education means to inspire people to live more abundantly, to learn to begin life as they find it and make it better. As a student and teacher of African American studies, the broader lessons of my teaching inevitably concern the ways in which higher education, what we study in university classrooms, must be aligned with the realities of social struggle and the civic responsibilities of living in a democracy. It may help my case that unlike Emerson, I have not chosen so vexatious a topic as institutional religion, nor am I like him admonishing you to go it alone, to refuse the good models, to reject out of hand the mind of the past. On the contrary, I invite you to walk with me this morning as I turn to a few of the good, though not perfect, models exemplified by many minds of the past. Some of the names I reference will be familiar to you, others maybe not. But because this talk resembles aspects of a classroom lecture, to save us time this morning, let me pause to note that I will post the speech next week on the website of the Carter G. Woodson Institute along with a detailed bibliography of references. Part of your assignment. Think of me as addressing you by appealing to the minds of the past that have influenced me. Think of my advice as coming largely through their words and constituting a part of your textual inheritance. In answering for myself the question that had caused me such initial distress, what can I say? I ultimately decided to embrace once more the wisdom of Audre Lorde. There are no new ideas, she reminds us, just new ways of giving those ideas we cherish breath and power in our own living. Joseph Brodsky, the Russian poet and essayist, chimed in with reinforcement from his perspective as poet writing public addresses. No matter what a poet may plan to say at the moment of the speech, he always knows he inherits the subject. Brodsky continues, the great literature of the past humbles me, not only through its quality, but through its topical precedence as well. I would like to translate precedence here to mean priority including but not reducible to temporality. I also mean priority in the sense of urgency, of what demands our attention now. What then, from among this vast textual inheritance, would work best for this occasion? And what are its implications for our times? Time became my guide. Stage two, choosing a text for the times. Of the numerous topics around which I have organized my research and oriented my courses over the decades of my career, since 2013, the year most of you matriculated to this university, at least the undergraduates, I have been at work on an initiative that I term 50 over 5, remembering the modern movement for civil rights. Multifaceted in scope, the initiative has included a sequence of courses, each focused on a pivotal year in a five-year trajectory from 1963 to 1968. I have been partly inspired by the fact that since 2013, we have witnessed a series of 50th anniversaries, hence 50 over five, marking major milestones in the modern civil rights movement, which will culminate in 2018. Although historians have rightly challenged and complicated this way of framing the movement, which many prefer to call the long black freedom struggle, extending centuries back, at least in the popular imagination, the stretch of years between 2013 and 2018 
constitute the quintessence of the modern era of the movement, an era meriting these anniversary celebrations. And so many in the nation have been observing them, beginning with the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Freedom Summer, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the 1966 Watts Uprising, the birth of the Chicago Freedom Movement, and the Supreme Court's versus Bond versus Floyd decision, which ruled that the Georgia House of Representatives had denied Julian Bond his freedom of speech when it refused to seat him in the legislature to which he had been duly elected. This is, of course, an abbreviated listing. Now we have arrived at 1967, which brought its own milestones. Julian Bond took his seat in the 136th District of Georgia. The Poor People's Campaign was launched. Martin Luther King delivered Beyond Vietnam, a time to break silence from the pulpit of Riverside Church in New York City, and published his very last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. This is our text for this morning, around which others will revolve as I deliver my abbreviated lesson, in which is contained your next assignment, a series of implicit and explicit challenges to you just before you take your leaves from these very hallowed grounds. Like many lessons, this one will necessarily involve repetition and review, things you've heard before and things you haven't. It will involve as well an attempt to find in the text of Martin Luther King and many of his contemporaries, and as well as his ancestors, directions for our times. In other words, I have not selected this text merely because of the convenience and coincidence of the calendar, nor for the poetic symmetry my training bids me notice. No, I have chosen it because 50 years since its publication, its words still resonate, its lessons still teach, its injunctions still call us forth to take up the responsibilities of citizenship, to make real the promises of democracy, as King put the matter in his far more famous speech, I Have a Dream. Stage three, reading the text. By the time King came to publish Where Do We Go From Here, he had reached the grim conclusion that legal structures had in practice proved neither structures nor law. He went on to assert the recording of the law in itself is treated as the reality of reform, despite the gulf between the laws and their enforcement. By 1967, he had reached the equally grim conclusion that each step forward in this long freedom struggle accents an ever-present tendency to backlash and though not standing at that moment in 1967, exactly where he was when he accepted the place of leadership for which a community had prepared and claimed him way back there in Montgomery in 1955, the pace of progress in the interim had been sluggish indeed. I find it significant that unlike the titles of his other books, where do we go from here takes the form of a question, a simple question. And in the space of six simple monosyllabic words, King gestures toward an answer, the one which is far from simple. There is subtle movement implied in the title from where at the beginning, here at the end, before we arrive at the subtitle, chaos or community. There in the middle of these six deceptively simple words sits we. I will come back to we as well as to the subtitle in a few moments. In the larger economy of the book, the first chapter of which is titled, Where Are We? King makes one point crystal clear. Before we can know where we go from here, we must know where we are right now. 
we must take the pulse of the times. We are here in Charlottesville, Virginia, where it pains me to acknowledge that we, like so many communities, especially university communities, are living through tense and contentious times, which we will weather. Many colleges and universities are openly confronting their origins in and profits from the institution of slavery and are simultaneously challenging, um, confronting their legacies, the history of the Confederate past, and most especially the signs and symbols that glorify the Confederacy. Citizens of New Orleans have had to work in camouflage as they have dismantled over the last few weeks Confederate statuary, the last of which came down just this week. Citizens of Charlottesville have spent better than the last year diving with both feet into this controversy, engaging it in open and often furious but ultimately constructive debate. Last week on Saturday evening, May 13th, our town came literally face to face with this history in the form of those who would preserve it, <laughs> along with the intolerance, racism, and white supremacy it represents. None of this is new, and far more urgent matters beg for our attention. Matters King delineated exhaustively in where do we go from here. We are at a moment that bears unsettling resemblance to the time of King's time. In that book, and in the numerous speeches he delivered well before its publication, King denounced what he termed the unspeakable horrors of police brutality the interrelated evils of racism, poverty, militarism, materialism, the deplorable state of public education, high rates of black imprisonment, joblessness, lower life expectancies, and many other intractable disparities. We witness such disparities at the same time we are repeatedly enjoined to turn the page, to recognize that we as a country are now living in a post-civil rights, post-racial, post-political moment. But King demands that we complicate this progressivist narrative in order to refocus our attention on the where, the here, and the now. Stage four, respecting time. In rereading many of King's speeches and sermons for this occasion, I am struck by how often he positions himself in the here and now, invoking alongside the rhetorical flourishes, lofty metaphors, and eloquent passages that define his oratory, those most mundane words, here, now, locating and orienting us in space and time. Indeed, in the December 1955 speech that launched his career as a social justice warrior, King began, we are here, we are here this evening for serious business. We are here because first and foremost, we are American citizens. We are here because of our love of democracy. There in that speech delivered at the Holt Street Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, King urged on his audience his view that in order for democracy to be transformed from thin paper to thick action, his words, injustice and inequality must be uprooted wherever they flourished. With this speech in 1955, King planted the seed that would ripen into his least well-known, certainly his least celebrated, least popular speech against the Vietnam War in 1967. In that speech, titled A Time to Break Silence, delivered at Riverside Church, roughly one year to the day before his 1968 assassination, King knew that the times called for an end to silence regarding the Vietnam War. He knew that his dissent would embolden his enemies and estrange his friends and allies most notably Lyndon Johnson, as well as the leadership of the NAACP. But he explained his decision to dedicate himself to the cause of peace, a dedication fully compatible with the broader cause 
of social justice. In answering his critics, King argued, ultimately a genuine leader is not a center for consensus, but a molder of consensus. And on some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Experience asks, is it politic? Vanity asks, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must take it because conscience tells him it is right. And that is where I find myself. In connecting these two points, Montgomery and New York, King spoke to his understanding of the march, that the march of progress is anything but strictly linear. This reality re required what he and his contemporary Ella Baker both understood, the importance of developing a long range view of political struggle. As I move to complete this lesson, let me return to the subtitle of where do we go from here? Chaos or community? King lays the groundwork for a provisional answer in the final chapter of this book titled The World House. The World House. There, King began by referencing the notes of a famous novelist containing a list of possible plots for future stories. The most prominent on the list King noted was this. A widely separated family inherits a house in which they have to live together. He goes on to say, this is the great new problem of mankind. We have inherited a large house, a great world house in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture and interests, who because we can never again live apart, must learn somehow to live with each other in peace. The answer then to the question, chaos or community, could not be clearer unless we learn to live in community, to cultivate the ethics of the we, chaos will ensue. To repeat, by 1967, with the much vaunted victories of the movement behind him, King knew as he had always known that far greater challenges lay ahead, but they would not be his alone to solve. He knew that it was they, the people, who had begun the struggle of which he was now the symbol and leader. And it was they who had been doing and would continue to do this work. By 1967, King's leadership was being fiercely tested by the youth, who questioning and often rejecting the strategies of his organization the Southern Christian Leadership Council, had begun to take this social revolution in different directions. Some, especially the students who form the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, guided and encouraged by Ella Baker. Baker had long insisted that strong people don't need strong leaders, and that organizations don't necessarily make movements. Explaining her own orientation as an activist and organizer, Baker noted, I was never working for an organization. I always tried to work for a cause. And that cause was bigger than any organization. Baker was certainly right. Though youth turned to her for guidance and direction, they and she were well aware that youth must find for themselves the directions their work would take. They must find their own where, their own here. My late and still lamented colleague, Julian Bond, was one such person. He gives an account of how he came to join 
with his fellow students at Morehouse College from the very perch of a cafe in Atlanta, Georgia. Reading about the Greensboro, North Carolina sit-ins in a newspaper, his colleague Lenny King says, have you seen this? Do you think it could happen here? Bond answered, I know it could happen here. The rest is history. Bond was then about the same age as many of you are who, see, who sit before me. I am encouraged by the exemplary work many of you are doing, not just on these grounds, but throughout Charlottesville and beyond, working on the living wage campaign, assisting refugees, canvassing on behalf of affordable housing. Our students, you are all making us proud and making it abundantly clear that you refuse to adjust to injustice, a refusal that links you in a big, wide, growing we of other youth across this nation who have committed themselves to an ethic of service and a spirit of reform. I give you one of your last assignments, join them. As I take my seat this morning, let me recap this lesson's central points. Discover what you are afraid to say and why. Trust the process of your doing. Honor questions. Find your own here. Believe with King in the fierce urgency of now. I would also like to leave you with a clutch of my hopes for you. May you find a cause that fires you. Excuse me, I have lost the page of my speech. Okay, here we are. May you find a cause that fires you. May you find work that gives you meaning. May you find a career that is rewarding. May you choose a life worth living. And may each and every one of you be claimed. Thank you very much.